Pastor John came to me uh, last week and, and uh, he shared some insights with me about uh, kind of the current series that we've been in. And, um, and I told him, I said, I want you to speak on that next Sunday. And so, uh, so it's, I'm excited about the message that he has for us today. How many think that he's got a word from the Lord? Yeah. So, my son, come on up here. And, uh, Lord, we just thank you for this man of God and for the word that you put in his heart. We thank you for uh, the, the transformation that you brought in his life, the, the, the things of the spirit and kingdom that are cultivated within him, from which uh, a well that we're going to drink from here today by your Holy Spirit. So, Lord, fill his mouth direct his speech and may we be instructed by the spirit of god and chained by your word in jesus name amen good morning you guys look pretty good like me well i want to share a passage of scripture with you guys today that um really impacted me as a teenager, and it continues to define my life today, and I hope it's going to rattle your cage and rock your boat and take you places that you've never been. So if you've got your Bible, uh, go ahead and turn to Psalm 24. Psalm 24, and we're going to be looking at verses 3 through 6. This might be the first time you're hearing this passage, or maybe you've heard it a million times, but I hope today that we can break it down in a way that's real and in a way that you won't forget. Psalm 24, verses 3 through 6. It says, Who may ascend the mountain of the Lord. Who may stand in his holy place? The one who has clean hands and a pure heart, who does not trust in an idol or swear by a false god. They will receive blessing from the Lord and vindication from God their Savior. Such is the generation of those who seek him, who seek your face, O God of Jacob. So let's break it down. We can read through those few verses really quickly and be like, okay, yeah, 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 that's great. But it means so much. So let's just, let's just start off here. The mountain. It says, who may ascend the mountain? What's that talking about? The mountain is a picture that surfaces throughout the Old Testament and the New Testament, but primarily in the Old Testament, and it's a picture of the kingdom of God. And it's always a place where people meet with God. And you see that God does this again and again. Um, the, one of the first places you see it is where Abraham met God when he brought his son Isaac to the top of the mountain to prepare a sacrifice. And when he was going to sacrifice his son, God said, you don't have to do that. I'll provide for you revelation of God as Jehovah Jireh came from that mountain experience. The mountain also refers to Mount Sinai, Mount Horeb, places where God met Moses face to face. Throughout the Exodus, we read that God came with fire on top of the mountain. It's where God spoke to Moses, where God released his covenant. The mountain also refers to the place where God dwells on Mount Zion, where the temple was built, the Temple Mount. Um, again, the place where he was totally visible by fire. It refers prophetically to Mount Carmel, where the prophet Elijah would confront the false prophets of Baal. And God came with fire 
and showed himself to be the true God. It's interesting to me, maybe you've heard the, the name for God, El Shaddai. El Shaddai has been translated primarily God Almighty, and that's, that's not quite a literal translation. The literal translation of El Shaddai is God, the mountain one. One of the revelations that he gives of himself is, I am the mountain one. And it's a picture that I believe God wants to burn in the heart of all of his people, this, this mountain. And, and again, the mountain it was the Old Testament way of talking about the kingdom of God, the kingdom of heaven, of heavenly places. The next thing we see in, in verse 3 is it talks about the holy place. And holy is not quite an English word yet. Holy has a meaning. And the meaning of holy is set apart for a special purpose. Usually when we think about holy, we think of, we think of like goody two-shoes, you know. Of there's, there's no sin. There's, but holy means set apart for a special purpose set apart for a different use. Holy is not just the opposite of evil. Holy is the opposite of normal. It's the opposite of average. When something is holy, it's set apart to be different for a special use. I have my, my music equipment up here. It's set apart. One of the reasons I put it up here on a stage is so I don't have kids stomping on it. I take care of it. It's, it's my holy equipment, if you will. There, there are things that I, that I set apart from the rest. And then at home, I can use a junker guitar. You know, just ah, trash this, beat this. Let kids drool on it, whatever. <laughs> but this is the holy guitar. This is the set apart. And uh, when, when God gave Moses instructions about building the tent of meeting, there were all of these different tools and articles that would be inside of the tent of meeting. And God said, these are holy. And you read about what those things were, and they were spoons. You know, like a holy spoon. Woo! <laughs> this spoon has never sinned once in its life. <laughs> No, that's not what it's talking about. It's talking about this spoon is separate. This belongs to the tent of meeting, and it will never be used for anything else. Everything that was inside of the tent of meeting was set apart for God, set apart for his use. So the holy place, it's a place that's set apart, and it is the exact opposite of normal and average the holy place refers to the place where God's, the place of God's presence where Moses heard the voice of God. Remember, he came to the burning bush and God said, take off your shoes. This is, this is holy ground. God wasn't talking about that this, this particular sand had never sinned. <laughs> he was saying, no, right now, this, this sand belongs to me. This is the sand that's close to me for my use. And don't track that sand into this. This is separate. It's a place where God's voice came to Moses. It also refers to the innermost place of the tent of meeting, the holy of holies. The most holy place in the holy of holies. And that's where God would meet with the priests by fire. And the priest would bring in the sacrifice. God would answer by fire. It's the place where God sat enthroned between the cherubim, where he released his words over the nation. And I think most importantly, it's talking about heavenly places. If you read the book of Hebrews, it says that the earthly tent of meeting, the tabernacle, was just a copy of what actually exists in heaven. There is a holy place in the heavenly realms where God is. And that's what it's referring to. So 
So then it asks this question, who may ascend to that place and who may stand there? One of the things that we need to realize right away when we read that is that not everyone is on the mountain or in the holy place. In fact, it's kind of assuming that people are not. It's not automatic. And it's saying there are requirements to be in those places. I also want to point out that nowhere in this this chapter does it say anything about when you die. It's not even mentioned. It's referring to the life that you and I are living right now. God is the mountain one, and he wants us to be his mountain people, that we live for the mountain, that we live for the holy place. And, and again, this, this verse never says anything about you get to um, graduate to the top of the mountain when you die or you get to graduate to the holy place when you die, it's asking who, who can go there now with the life that they're living? It doesn't say you can automatically get there to the top of the mountain when you die and you can just do whatever you want in the valley right now. So it asks the question, who may ascend, who may stand, the mountain, the holy place? And then it gives the answer. It says, the one who, or he who. And what's, what's interesting to me about that is it, it's very individual right at that point. The one who. It immediately throws it back on the person reading and saying, are you that one? Or not? It's an individual choice and responsibility that will determine whether you ascend the mountain or stand in the holy place. It's not something that you get by hanging out with other people who have chosen that. It's a choice you have to make for yourself. And then he goes on to describe what that one does and what they're like. It says, they have clean hands and a pure heart. The ones who stand in the holy place, the ones who ascend the mountain, are very concerned with what they do, where they go. You think about your hands. Your hands are what you work with. Your hands are also determine who you're with. Who are your friends? Who are you? Who are you joined with? Or even a picture of marriage. You have clean hands. It's about your actions. And then it talks about a pure heart. A pure heart would have to do with what what I think about, what I'm searching for, what I'm hoping for, my desires. And often, I think as believers, we don't stop very, very much to examine, are my hands clean? Is my heart pure? We kind of just breeze on, like I, at some point I said a prayer, and uh, now I'm good. But Psalm 24 asks this question, who may ascend? Who may stand in that place? It's very concerned with what you do and, and how your heart is. The word pure is really interesting. It's almost a bad word these days. You don't want to talk about that. It's something that people mock. But it's, it's still as valuable as it ever was. I've got a wedding ring, pure gold. It's valuable because it's pure gold. It's a statement about how much my marriage means to me, how much my wife means to me. I didn't just go get a chintzy ring pop, you know. (laughs) This is the ring I always wear. It always symbolizes my love for my wife. 
what makes the gold pure is that it's only gold, right? There's only one thing in this metal. If you were to mix something else into the gold, even if it was pretty valuable, you know, some silver or something, it wouldn't be pure gold anymore. Now it's a mixture, something else. Purity is defined by one thing. There's only one thing. This is pure gold because gold is all there is. And the measure of purity increases the value. The more that just one thing exists, the more valuable it is. Nobody would want a, go a, a, a ring that was you know, like, oh, it's mostly pure. <laughs> it's pretty valuable. We're not sure how much, but <laughs> you, know, you go for, for what's pure. It's defined by one thing. Jesus made this statement in Matthew 5. He said, blessed are the pure in heart, for they will see God. People who are pure in heart only have one thing in their heart. They only have one pursuit. So often in the Western version of Christianity, we present Jesus as something that you can add to your life to make it better. But Jesus wants to be the only thing in your life, your only pursuit, your source of life, your one desire. Someone who's pure in heart, that doesn't necessarily mean that you're flawless. It means that you have one pursuit. And that when decisions come up of whether you could pursue this or pursue this, you're like, nope, I'm, I'm staying centered on this one thing. That's all that matters to me. Clean hands and a pure heart. Now here's, here's really awesome news, and that is that well, let me give the bad news first. The bad news is that that doesn't really define any of us. You know, if, if I were to interview every one of us in the room and say, okay, how clean are your hands and how pure is your heart? We wouldn't do so well. I remember someone pointing this out very well to me as a teenager saying, if, if you want to know how pure your thoughts are and how clean your life is, what if we were to replay every day of your life and every thought you've ever had on the screen in front of church? <laughs> what if everyone could read your thoughts and watch it? What if everyone could see what you did while you were alone? Suddenly we're like, whoa, <laughs> no thanks. We don't have clean hands and a pure heart. And I'm so grateful for the good news that Jesus has come with those things that we were not. Jesus comes and he removes every disqualification that we had to stand in the holy place and to ascend the mountain. That is completely impossible for us outside of Jesus. You can't do it. It's not available to us. But Jesus made it available, removed all of the disqualifications. So the question is, why, why then would this passage even be relevant to us as believers in Jesus? If Jesus removed our disqualifications, why should we care about clean hands and a pure heart? Last week, my dad was reading from Hebrews 12. Hebrews 12 has some crazy things to say to Christians. And I, I just want to read a little bit of this to you again. You can, you can stay in Psalm 24. Um, keep a marker in that. But in Hebrews 12, chapter 14, it says, or sorry, Hebrews chapter 12, verse 14, it says, make every effort to live in peace with everyone and to be holy. Make every effort. It is not contradictory to the grace of God to make an effort to be holy. It's a command of God. Because you have grace on your life, make every effort to be holy. Without holiness, 
no one will see the Lord. Wouldn't that stink to be a Christian and never see God? What's the point? See to it that no one falls short of the grace of God and that no bitter root grows up to cause trouble and defile many. See that no one is sexually immoral or is godless like Esau, who for a single meal sold his inheritance rights as the oldest son. Afterward, as you know, when he wanted to inherit this blessing, he was rejected. Even though he sought the blessing with tears, he could not change what he had done. This is a New Testament verse aimed right at us. If you didn't get last week's message, go online and get it. It's, it's awesome with the full story of Jacob and Esau. But God is, God is saying to his own people, make every effort to be holy. Without holiness, no one will see the Lord. See to it that no one falls short of the grace of God. See, here's the reality is Jesus has made it com- completely possible for you and I to live on the mountain, to live in the holy place. He's removed every reason why we couldn't. He has set us apart. He's transferred us out of the kingdom of darkness into the kingdom of his son, his wonderful light, the New Testament says. So if we were to translate this into English real quick, it says, make every effort to be set apart. See, Jesus sets you and I apart, but often we don't stay set apart. Jesus gives us something awesome, and then we're like, yeah, okay, I'm going to do what's normal. I'm going to do what I feel like. I'm going to do what I've always done. I'm going to do what all my friends do. It's easy. And I'm not saying necessarily that you go back to sin. That should be obvious that we shouldn't do that, right? Yes, yes, okay. (laughs) But we go back to normal. We go back to average. And then if you're in that place, it's very easy to sin. It's very easy to go back into everything you came out of. And so the writer of Hebrews is saying, make every effort to keep yourself set apart. If God has put this in front of you, why would you waste it? Why would you leave it behind? Without being set apart, no one will see the Lord. See, because He is set apart. And if you aren't where He is set apart, you don't see Him. If I were to give the example of God is over in that room, you can't see him unless you also go in that room. And here's the deal is he has given you all of the power to go into that room. Nothing holds you back. He's pulling you. He's calling you to be with him. But you have to go to see him. And that's why this verse says, see to it that no one falls short of the grace. The grace is right out there for anybody who wants it, but not everybody takes it. And again, I want to call us back to, this is not about when you die, this is about the life you live right now. When Jesus came, he came with the message that the kingdom of heaven is at hand. He did not say, repent so that you can get into the kingdom of heaven when you die. He said, change the way you're living right now because the kingdom is here right now. And then he proved it by pulling the supernatural, the things of heaven, right into those situations. Everyone knows the lame will walk in heaven. Jesus said, let's have the lame walk now because the kingdom is here now. Let's have the blind see now. All of the kingdom is available now. But sometimes we miss it. 
And so the writer of Hebrews is saying, see to it that you don't fall short of it, because that's what people normally do. We normally don't live on the mountain. We normally miss the holy place. Okay, now let's go back over to the uh, Psalm 24 passage. He goes on, he says, to describe this person who ascends the mountain, he says, does not lift up his soul to an idol or to what is false. In one of the ways my dad describes an idol is it's anything that you believe is a source of life and that you serve or seek after to draw life from. If you think that you can't live without that thing, then it's an idol. See, that was the issue with the Israelites when Elijah was walking around. And nobody was, it seemed like everybody was confused and they're, they're worshiping Baal. Now it's interesting, when Elijah confronted them, he said, if, if God is God, then serve him. If Baal is God, then serve him. Why are you wavering between two opinions? See, they wanted the God of the Bible and they wanted Baal because they believed that the God of the Bible, it would be a really bad idea to make him mad. But they worshiped Baal and they worshiped Ashtoreth because they wanted the benefits of those gods. Bless their crops, send rain, which didn't work very well. But, <laughs> you know, they, they viewed that there were certain benefits that they would draw if they appeased these gods. If they worshiped them, they would seek after them. And Elijah said, you can't do that. That's an idol to you. You think you're getting life from that. And it's the same thing for us. When, when we have anything in our life, we're like, I can't live without this. I won't be satisfied without this. And we've got an idol. And we, we know all the normal examples. Modern day idols are money, relationships with certain individuals. I think our comfort zone. I think one of the, the biggest things is ourselves. I'm afraid to let go of me and just let God have his way. We're very interested in preserving ourselves and our reputation. Those are all idols. Leif Hetlin put it this way. He said, an idol is anything or anyone you have to check with before obeying the Holy Spirit. It's just like, I want to obey God and what he says in his ways, but I've got to make sure I don't make this other person mad. I've got to make sure my bank account can handle this. <laughs> rather than just moving with what he says. The people who ascend the hill of the Lord aren't trapped up in that. I don't know, we're in, we're in Montana. I don't know how many of you hike. That's the only reason to live here, right? <laughs> David. When you hike, if you're serious about hiking, going somewhere, you prepare for it. And one of the keys to being an awesome hiker is taking as little with you as possible. You don't drag 40 pound idols up mountains with you. <laughs> it would just be stupid because you'd never make it, you'd wear out. So you take as little as you can. I mean, you go over to Sportsman, they've got, you know, you can buy yourself a $100 pair of socks that are lightweight. <laughs> you know, everything's got to be lightweight. It's got to be conducive to getting you up the mountain so you're not carrying anything extra with you. And so often we are, we are literally trying to haul our idols, multiple idols up the mountain with us. And, and you get tired and you just can't do it. And then... Various translations say something about false <laughs> in this verse. It's not swear falsely or swear by a God that is false, but, but 
that's really an issue right now. We live in a world of virtual reality. That's, that's what we care about. And the idea of virtual reality is that I can, I can have a realm where I am God and my life is everything I want it to be. And other people in my world are what I want them to be. Everything is I choose. And we all know that's not really how life works, but we're living in a world of virtual reality. And it's, it's overtaking who we are. You have more friends on Facebook than in real life. And the picture that they see of you every time is the professional photo from six years ago. <laughs> You're controlling reality in your own little world to build what you want. And that's just a minor example, but we're building a culture where you can just pick what you would like to be in your world and exclude what doesn't feel nice, what's uncomfortable. But we need to decide to not live in virtual reality. We need to decide, I'm going to live with the reality that God says is reality and with truth as he says is truth. Not a world where I can just block out what I don't like. A world where he's God and I am what he says I am. And then it says those type of people will go up, go up the mountain, they'll stand in the holy place, and then it says, and they will receive blessing. Not everyone receives blessing. This is really important. Just because you're a Christian does not mean you are receiving blessing. You probably know that already. <laughs> you can identify parts of your life where you're like, that's not very blessed, no. <laughs> Thank you, but we could, we could do with a little more blessing there. Not everyone receives blessing. It's the one who is like these things. Now, what's interesting is this word for blessing is the exact same word for blessing that Esau despised and Jacob grasped for. The blessing that Isaac gave his sons is the same thing. God speaks these blessings. God releases these blessings to people who are like what we just described. And even the word blessing, the first, the first meaning of this blessing is prosperity. You've got abundance in what you do and what you have. And when you set your hand towards something, it works. That's the first meaning of blessing. It means gifts or presents that are given to you. It means that God praises you when God's talking about you like he's like yeah that guy is awesome <laughs> and it means that you have a treaty of peace with God God has made a deal with you of peace always when God speaks his blessing those are the things that, that you receive not everyone receives that and so my dad was pointing out that passage last week from Hebrews 12. See to it that no one falls short of the grace of God or is godless like Esau, who for a single meal said, I don't need that blessing. And then it talks about the generation the generation of those who seek your face. That this word for generation is not literally years generation. It's, it's a word that means the characteristic, the type, the company of people. There will be a group of people that seek God's face. They don't just believe that there is a God somewhere. 
They say, if there is a God, I must see him. If there is a God, I must know him. I have to be close to him. I'm not satisfied to live at a distance. The generation that seeks, seeking is active. When you come to Jesus, he gives you everything you need to live on the mountain, in the holy place, to go after it. So let's do it. Seeking. It's pursuit. It knows that there's something that would be missed and won't be found without action. And I'll say it again. This generation, this group of people will not be satisfied with anything less than the face of God. Now here's, I want to get to this last part. Every translation you got out there, NIV, New King James, NAS, whatever, they all have the name Jacob. And some of the different translations have processed it differently. But to me, this is, this is the key to the whole thing. NIV, it says, Such is the generation of those who seek your face, O God of Jacob. This is saying something very specifically about God and how he wants us to relate to him. It does not say, O God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. It does not say, O Lord. It says, O God of Jacob. I believe that the people who ascend the hill of the Lord, the mountain of God, the people who stand in his holy place, are people like Jacob. In fact, the new King James puts it this way. It goes through Psalm 24, describes them, and it says, this is Jacob, the generation of those who seek him, who seek your face. This passage talks about what Jacob was. There is a generation, a group of people that will be called Jacob. Some of you know Shampa Rice. She's called her ministry Jacob Generation. And it's about this. Now you may recall last week, Jacob was a stinker. He's a twin, his brother Esau. He came out of the womb grasping the heel of his brother as if to say, I'm not going to be left out. <laughs> Me first. His name means he grasps the heel or supplanter. If you don't know the word supplanter, like I didn't, <laughs> I looked it up. The word supplanter means someone who will take the place of another by any means possible. And you see the attitude of Jacob as he said, Esau, if you don't want it, I want it. Jacob could see things that were valuable that his brother did not see. You see, Esau lived according to his feelings. He said, what good is this birthright to me? I'm about to die. It's a slight exaggeration. <laughs> he went for a hike and he thinks he's going to die. <laughs> he's hungry. He was, he's not going to keel over. He let something as simple as his stomach determine his destiny. In the New Testament, Paul said, people whose God is their stomach and their glory is their shame. Esau was one of those people. He's like, you know, I just do whatever I feel. Whatever, whatever my body wants right now, that's what I'm going to have. And you can see through the way he lived, if you study a little more about Esau, um, he married people he shouldn't have married. He married two women who were Canaanite women. And he knew better. Remember Abraham, for his son Isaac, he, he said to his servant, do not let my son Isaac marry one of these women. They're not part of the promise. Go get a girl who's part of the promise, not a girl who worships these gods. And then you see even Jacob. Jacob went back home. He did not marry a Canaanite, but Esau did. And it says that his, he caused his parents grief 
because of the choice he made of marrying Canaanite women. So he did what he wanted. Not, he wasn't concerned about God's promises. He wasn't concerned about God's destiny on his family. He valued the present more than the future. It's like, whatever's happening right now, that's all that matters. We'll worry about later, later. And he didn't change until it was too late. But then you have Jacob. Jacob was the type of guy who said, you know what? That promise rightfully belongs to my brother, but he doesn't want it, and I do. And I will do whatever it takes. I'll lie, cheat, and steal to get it. He was driven to have that. He valued the prophecies, the promises, more than Esau did. He lived with the future in mind. He didn't allow his present feelings to sway his decisions. He seized every opportunity. You see a little later in Genesis, Jacob even wrestled with God. He's like, you know what? I'm going to get this blessing one way or another. <laughs> he stole the birthright. He stole the blessing. And he wrestled with God to get more blessing. He wasn't satisfied with where he was at. He wanted the highest that he could have. And God honors a heart that says, I don't care what it costs. I don't care how long it takes. I don't care how long I wait. I must have more of you. I will come after you. I will seek your face. Jacob was that type of guy. Jacob saw the face of God. Where the place where he wrestled with God after he was done, he, he named it face of God. He said, I saw the face of God and I didn't die. It's amazing. And there are people who, are, who say, I am going to pursue God no matter what, because that's all I want. God honored that so much. In Malachi 1, God went on to say, Jacob I loved, Esau I hated. God loved the heart of Jacob that said, I will possess these promises, I will possess the inheritance, I will possess what comes from heaven no matter what it takes. Jacob didn't just steal sheep from his brother. <laughs> Jacob took the promise that God gave to Abraham. The word for blessing that's, that was pronounced is the same blessing that God gave to Abraham. He said, I will bless you and your descendants, and this is what I will do. I will bless all the nations of the earth through you. Jacob said, I want to be part of something eternal, something that impacts all people for all time. When he, when he was grasping for that inheritance, he was going more, it wasn't just about his personal gain. He said, I want to be part of what heaven is doing. That's what my life is about. And God loved that in Jacob. I'm going to read just a few verses to you from Obadiah 1, where God prophesied about the people who came from Esau. You may, you may remember that Esau was also called Edom. His, and his descendants were called Edom. It says, In that day, declares the Lord, will I not destroy the wise men of Edom, those of understanding in the mountains of Esau? But on Mount Zion will be deliverance. It will be holy, and Jacob will possess his inheritance. Jacob will be a fire, and Joseph a flame. Esau will be stubble. And they will set him on fire and destroy him. There will be no survivors from Esau. The Lord has spoken. Deliverers will go up on Mount Zion to govern the mountains of Esau, and the kingdom will be the Lord's. See, what God's doing through Jacob people is life and death. It's serious. And God's looking for Jacob people people who are like him and say, I am going to pursue the things of God no matter what it costs. I will do whatever it takes. I have to live on the mountain. And 
The mountain is a picture about living in heavenly places. My dad's been talking about this for, for many weeks now. Colossians 3, since then you have been raised with Christ. Set your hearts on things above. It's a picture of the mountain. Set your hearts on things above where Christ is, seated at the right hand of God. Set your minds on things above, not on earthly things. For you died and your life is now hidden with Christ in God. Paul said that because it's, it's so easy for us to, to receive the grace of Jesus. That he raises us up to be seated in heavenly places, but we still live with our minds down here, and we do everything everyone else does. And we miss out the entire benefit of being raised up with Christ. And I believe there's going to be two, that there are only two types of people. There are, there are people who are Jacob people who are on their way up the mountain. And there are valley people. There's people who live for holiness, who live to be set apart. And there are people who are satisfied with normal. There's no in between those two. The, the middle of the road, everything in moderation approach is Esau. It's the generation that's the, the type of people that would, that would say, you know, try to have clean hands when you can. <laughs> have a pure heart most of the time. Seek God on Sundays. When, when we don't have a passion for going up, we don't go up. Going up mountains is hard. And I, and I believe that the picture was given of a mountain and the question, who may ascend? Because God wanted us to have that picture in our minds and relate it to something that we understand. What's it like to hike a mountain? I would challenge you, do it this week. Go hike a mountain. And then ask God, okay, so what does this mean about how I'm doing with you? It's way easier to start walking up the foothills and then be like, you know, <laughs> never mind. <laughs> Let's go back down, you know. There's, there's no middle of the road with this stuff. When you, when you when you allow yourself to back off from that, that is Esau. Jacob will be a fire, and Esau will be stubble. And it says, there will be no survivors from Esau. If you, if you live your life with the Esau kind of life, everything that you are, everything that you do will have no meaning at all. No one will remember you. God won't. His people won't. People will remember Jacob type people. So as a teenager, this verse really gripped me. And it's it's been a defining passage for my life. And I believe God wants it to define all of his people, that we have this image in our minds the mountain of the Lord, the holy place. And we say, I am going to be the one who ascends the hill of the Lord. Not when I die. I'm going to ascend the hill of the Lord now. I live for the mountain. If he's the mountain one, I'm going to be with the mountain one where he is. Whatever it takes. People who are moving in that in that direction are always asking God, okay, God, what extra weight am I packing up this mountain? What have I got in my life that is holding me back from you? Because I want it gone. The only thing I live for is the top. If that's where you are, that's where I'm going to be. I can't hold hands with people who are going downhill while I'm trying to go uphill. <laughs> 
It doesn't work. You lose every time. <laughs> God, are my hands clean? God, is my heart pure? Am I seeking one thing? Or is it... I would, I would prefer to be in the mountain. <laughs> but, you know, my second best option would be... <laughs> And, and just, I'll throw this out there too. There's, there's been a, a metaphor that's been spoken a lot about, you know, living in the mountains and the valleys, and you have to go through valleys to get to mountains. That's a different metaphor completely. <laughs> and it's not a metaphor from Scripture, by the way. The metaphor from Scripture is go up to the mountain and stay there until God sends you down with a message. So right after Hebrews 12, let's, let's finish up here. Hebrews 12, verse 16 says, See that no one is sexually immoral or is godless like Esau, who for a single meal sold his inheritance rights as the oldest son. Afterward, as you know, when he wanted to inherit the blessing, he was rejected. Even though he sought the blessing with tears, he could not change what he had done. You know, we, we always think, I can choose God tomorrow. But you never know if tomorrow will come. And you, and you never know that your heart will be changed. Because when, when you say, I will seek God tomorrow, you said, I am hardening my heart to God. I do not want to hear God. And people get stuck in that place. You know, the Israelites said, oh, we're not going to go conquer that land. I mean, there's big people there. It's going to be hard. And... Uh, and then God said, okay, your next chance is 40 years from now. By the way, you'll all be dead. Your kids will do it, not you. We always think that we can just do it whenever we want. That's not necessarily true. Esau couldn't change it. And then it goes on to say, you have not come to a mountain that can be touched and that is burning with fire to darkness, gloom, and storm, to a trumpet blast, or to such a voice speaking words that those who heard, heard it begged that no further word be spoken to them, because they could not hear what was commanded. Even if an animal touches the mountain, it must be stoned to death. The sight was so terrifying that Moses said, I am trembling with fear. But you have come to Mount Zion, to the city of the living God, the heavenly Jerusalem. You have come to thousands upon thousands of angels in joyful assembly, to the church of the firstborn, whose names are written in heaven. You have come to God, the judge of all, to the spirits of the righteous made perfect, to Jesus, the mediator of a new covenant, and to the sprinkled blood that speaks a better word than the blood of Abel. See to it that you do not refuse him who speaks. And that's, that's what happens all the time. Is God calls us up the mountain and we're like, later. Or like, I'll do what I want now in the valley. When I die, you just make sure that's where I go. See to it that you do not refuse him who speaks. If they did not escape when they refused him who warned them on earth, how much less will we if we turn away from him who warns us from heaven? At that time, his voice shook the earth. But now he has promised, once more, I will shake not only the earth, but also the heavens. The words once more indicate the removing of what can be shaken. That is created things, so that what cannot be shaken may remain. Therefore, since we are receiving a kingdom that cannot be shaken, let us be thankful and so worship God acceptably with reverence and awe, for our God is a consuming fire. God's looking for people who are like, I'm going to that mountain, to that God who's a consuming fire, and I'm going to be just like him. I'm going to be Jacob. Jacob is a fire. Jacob grasps. Jacob seeks his face. Jacob wants one thing. Jacob will not let anything hold him back. So let's pray.
to God. So just, just in your own heart right now, go ahead and tell God what you want. Do you want to be one of those Jacob people? Do you want to be someone who's on fire? Do you want to be someone who goes up? Someone who stands in the holy place? Do you want the blessing? Do you want to take what Esau missed? And if that's what you want, just say, God, what's holding me back? There are many of you, you've already been to the top of the mountain. You lived there, but maybe you don't feel like you're living there right now. Say, God, what, what changed? Whose hands was I holding that got me down the mountain? <laughs> What idols do I have? God, am I living in a, a virtual reality that's my liking but not yours? God, we just say, make us like Jacob. Make us like Jacob, God. God, we want to go up your mountain where there's deliverance, where it's holy, where we possess the inheritance. where the kingdom is yours, God. God, make us people who live for something different. God, there's a whole generation around us we see living for nothing, living for virtual reality. And Lord, you said people who live like Esau, they're just gonna disappear. And God, we, we don't wanna be that. We want our lives to matter. We want our lives to change the world, to be full and satisfying. God, we're, we're tired of chasing things that don't satisfy. Thank you, God. God, if there's a Jacob generation, make us, make us one of them. And God, we, we just say, set a fire, set a fire, set us on fire, God. Burn everything that doesn't need to be there. Shake everything that needs to be shaken off. God, we want to be people that have wrapped our lives around something that is unshakable. So when the real shaking happens, we're not holding on to the wrong thing. God, we want to possess the unshakable inside of our hearts so that when the world is shaking, we're not moved. God, we want to be different. We want to be the opposite of normal, the opposite of average, God. Lord, we want to be the type of people where you say, I love your heart. I love your pursuit. And God, I just pray for all of us that you will wake us up if we are trading what matters, trading our inheritance 
for bowls of soup, God. Wake us up. And God, I pray if, if there's any of us who have said no to you in the past, so you give us another chance to say yes to you right now. And God, I just thank you that even now, even if we've messed up, you have given us everything we need so that we can go back up the mountain. You remove all of our disqualifications through the blood of Jesus. And so, Lord, we, we want to take you up on that offer. And we want to live there, God, set apart. Thank you, Lord.